Good morning. If you will, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. It's going to be our text for this morning. Often we have lessons that dive into the seven sayings of the cross. One of the, the sayings of that time that came from the lips of our dying Savior is found in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. It's about this particular text that I want to draw our attention to this morning. Such powerful words have never come from lips, then I forgive you. If you've ever heard those from someone that you needed forgiveness from, they are very sweet indeed. There are so many people that hold grudges that refuse to offer forgiveness even when it's been requested. And yet, when you find yourself in need of forgiveness, and you have requested it and someone denies it, what an awful feeling. And yet, when they grant that forgiveness, and they live in such a way that they have granted it, it makes such a difference in our lives. Here in this particular text, in Luke chapter 23, in verse 33, it says, And when they were come into the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified Him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now as we have just sang several hymns that speak of Calvary, and often we sing songs that talk about Calvary. When studying the cross, we notice that there are actually a couple of different words that are used in reference and description of that place where our Lord and Savior died. And we just sang that, that we believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. And certainly we do. But what is Calvary? Well, when you actually go back and you're trying to derive where these different words come from and from the different text and from the different Gospel accounts as they do use different words, the word Calvary is Latin. It's from the Roman language. And so, that is the word that is used. And actually, we can find that word even going back to the Latin translation of the New Testament in the Latin Vulgate. And there you can see it just as clear as can be where we would get that word in our English language. Well, when we go to other passages, we find in the American Standard, for example, it actually translates it as the place of the skull. It doesn't use the word Calvary. It uses the place of the skull. And matter of fact, in Matthew 27, 33, Mark 15, verse 22, and John chapter 19 and verse 17, also those words are used. The place of the skull. And if you look up skull from the Greek, you can see where we would derive in our English language cranium. And that's where we get our word, the cranium, which is representative of the skull. And so you can see how the transliterated version of that, cranion, where we would derive our English word cranium. And so that is what it's talking about when it's speaking of the skull. That's Greek for those Hellenists. And then we have in John chapter 19, and in verse 17, another word that we're familiar with, and that is the place called Golgotha. And it, it is derived from a different language as well. So you have three different languages representing those that location that is Calvary, and the place of the skull, and Golgotha. And this is from the Hebrew. And you can see how Golgotha literally, as it is transliterated, is Golgotha. That's where they get that word. And it is derived their meaning from the word that means skull. 
In John chapter 19 and verse 17, it specifically says, here's the place of the skull which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. And so we have three different references from these various languages here in this text. And what did it say over Jesus on that hill? His accusation was that He was the King of the Jews. That's it. That was the accusation. It was written above Him. It was written in three different languages. And so just as we've examined the description of Calvary, the place of the skull in Golgotha, that is referencing three different languages above Him, saying this is the King of the Jews is found in those three languages that are represented there. In John chapter 19 and verse 20, this title therefore read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew. So that's the transliterated word that I have in yellow. And in Latin, you can see why I would say that Latin is the Roman language. You can see it in the transliterated form of Latin and in the Greek. And that's why you would say this is the Hellenistic language of the day, which is Greek. And so the Hebrews, that is the Jews, spoke that language of the Hebrew language. Though there are some that have changed the recent translations to put in the, the, the words Aramaic, the Jews spoke Hebrew. And the passage itself says that's what was up there. It was in Hebrew. Why? Because the people of that day spoke Hebrew. It was not Aramaic, as some of the recent scholars have come along and have translated and changed it. And so this provides for us a little bit of a background as we move forward in our study. Here in this text, Jesus in this passage, in verse 34, He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the passage said they parted His raiment, and cast lots. What does it mean? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What did it mean then? And what does that mean for us today? That's what I want us to focus on as we look at three different parts of this prayer. And then we're going to make application. We're going to see three things that we ourselves can take away from this lesson today. And so at the very beginning, at the outset, we see the word Father. And so here is a prayer that is worded by our Savior as He's on the cross. Now, it was not uncommon for Jesus to pray. We know that before He came to the cross, where was He? Well, He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now as, as He was pouring out His heart and His soul, sweating as it were, great drops of blood on the ground, He was praying we know on other occasions as well that Jesus prayed and even taught others how to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, we have what is called the model prayer. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so even Jesus providing the teaching and the instruction on how to pray, and here we find that the Savior is on the cross. And he prays, Father. And you have this, this prayer that is there in which he is providing his wishes towards God. He is praying as a means of communication to deity, is speaking to the Father which is in heaven. So we have Father, that's a prayer. Secondly, he uses the word forgive, which is His plea. He is making this request of God the Father. And so Jesus said, forgive. And in this, when we actually look at the way that it is worded, the word forgive itself is a verb. It is in the aorist imperative, active second person plural, or excuse me, singular. And in this, what it means is, as he is making this plea, and he says, now Father, forgive. He is providing instruction. 
And when you look at the kind of action in the Greek language, he is providing instruction to the hearer. So he is speaking to the Father, providing instruction to the hearer, and charging the hearer to carry out the action or to perform that action. And so, as Jesus is on the cross, He's pleading with God, forgive. This was His heart's desire. Now the passage says that Jesus said, or He was saying, and when you look at the tense of this, it is found in the imperfect tense, which is the idea of a motion picture show that has been captured in the past, but then you are able to continue to see it continue. That's the idea of this phrase that, that Jesus was saying this. And what that means was, yes, it, they, they captured this, that Jesus said, Father, forgive them. That happened in the past. This is what He said. But we see what is continuing. And the idea there is that this was Jesus' plea then and continued to be. It wasn't just that He said it then and that was it. This was His plea and continued to remain His plea while He was on that cross. Father, forgive them. He continued to echo that plea as He was there upon the cross in agony there for you and me. This plea was from the core of His soul. And so He asked to forgive. What does that word mean? It means to loosen, to free, to liberate. And literally, if you took the original word and you broke it down, it means literally to send away from. The word forgive, if defined just from the root words that put together to make it, it means to send away from. He is asking the Father, He's pleading with the Father to forgive them of their transgressions, of their sins, of their actions. Father, forgive them. Send their sins away from them. Now, an illustration of this is found in Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, and you're welcome to turn there with me. In Psalm 103, verse 11 through 13, it says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear Him. Now in verse 13, the ESV says, as a father shows compassion or mercy, so that is what He has done Unto them. Jesus is there not because of any wrong that He has done. He's been put through a horrific trial, very unjust, breaking all laws, and yet they did it anyways because they wanted to crucify Him. They spit upon Him. They beat Him. They scourged Him. They slapped Him in the face. They beat upon Him a crown of thorns. They mocked Him. They jeered at Him. And He didn't deserve any of it. As an innocent person upon that cross, He looked down upon those that were responsible. And He had compassion. Now, sometimes that's hard for us to wrap our heads around. It is for me to think, what if I was, I put myself in his shoes and try to think of people treating me in such a way and how difficult that would have been. And, and then to turn around and to look upon them with mercy and, and compassion because naturally that, that is not what naturally is stirred up when someone treats us in such a way. And Jesus looks down upon them 
And He says, send it away. Forgive. Father, forgive. As far as the east is from the west, that is what is here. And so the God that we serve is merciful. He takes my sin and sends it away from His cognizance. This is His continual plea. We see as Jesus is on the cross, He says, Father, forgive them. Who is He speaking about? Who's the them that is present? Who killed Jesus? Now you can go back and you can read through the text and you can see the Jews were involved in that. They were guilty. You can go back and you look in the text and you can see there were Romans that were involved in that. They were guilty. The Jews used the Romans. Yeah, that's true. They were guilty of it. And so literally... Jesus is looking down upon those that potentially could have been those that scourged Him. Potentially those that were beating Him, had, had smote Him, that were there witnessing. And He looks down and He sees them. And He's praying to the Father, Father forgive them. And He's looking into the eyes of those that hung Him there. The Roman soldier that drove the nails into His hands and into His feet, was there. And He looks down upon them and asked that there would be forgiveness. You say, well, that, that's them. But when I think about who needs forgiveness and why Jesus had to go to the cross in the first place, and I realize it was my sins. Now we sing a, one of our songs. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. It was my sins. Our sins. Because what drove Jesus to that cross is His love for us and the reason He had to go there out of love for us is because of our sins that we needed forgiveness from. Because of His great love, He went there to that cross. Though He prayed there in the garden, if it's possible any other way, let it be. But nevertheless, Thy will be done. He prayed that, but He went anyways. The Bible teaches us in John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son. And that only begotten Son went to that cross out of love. Just as the Father loved us, the Son went to the cross out of love and He died on that cross for our sins. He says on the cross as Jesus is looking down, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They didn't even have a clue, really. In the grand scheme of things, what they were doing. Who really, many of them, didn't even really realize what they were doing, that they were hanging on that cross, the Chosen One, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Christ, the Savior of the world. As Jesus hung upon that cross, He prayed for those that were mistreating Him there at that very time. He prayed for them. And the only accusation they could put above His head was that He was the King of the Jews. That's it. And yet He hung there. He prayed for those that were responsible for His rejection, for His crucifixion. We can go to several passages that would illustrate something very similar to this. In Philippians chapter 2, 3 through 11, it tells us, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man upon his own things, but every man on the things of others. And then it says, Let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. Jesus went to the cross because He was thinking of others. He didn't hang on that cross because of His own sin. 
of his own wrongs, he hung there because of our sin. And out of humility of mind, he went there. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Even the death of the cross, wherefore God hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of the things in heaven and of earth and the things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Have this mind in you. I should have a heart that is willing to forgive. And I realize in Luke chapter 17 and verse 3, He says, Take heed therefore to yourselves, that if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And so I understand that the teaching is there, that we have to go. The Bible tells us if, if, if he's trespassed against us, our responsibility is we've got to go to him. We've got to rebuke him. We've got to tell him he's done something wrong to give him an opportunity to have that, that repentance so that he can be forgiven. You know, forgive in the text that we are considering this morning is the same word, exact same word in the Greek that is used here in this passage in, in Luke 17 and verse 3. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 18, Matthew 18, verse 21 through 22, Peter was there, he speaks to the Lord, he says, How oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. What does that mean? I mean, for me, and how does this apply to me? As I've looked at the Savior, He's on the cross and He has a heart of forgiveness. He, he came, He bled, He died on the cross so that there could be forgiveness. And then I look at Him as my model, as, my, as the chief shepherd who's leading before me. And what does that mean for me? It means I have to have a heart of forgiveness. A heart that is willing to forgive. Three things that can help us. Three simple steps that can help us in the area of forgiveness. Now true, as we've just read, if it's the case that someone has done so, we have opportunity to go to them so that there can be reconciliation. But we also know that in the Bible it teaches us that when someone mistreats us, when we face hardship, when we have difficulty in our life, we have an opportunity to go to God. Because the Bible teaches in 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 7 that God cares for us. He knows. He cares. And so we have an opportunity to bring our petitions, to pray to God according to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. We have an opportunity to pray, to cast our cares, and to bring our petitions before God. Number two, we can pray specifically if we find ourselves in a situation where there needs to be forgiveness. When someone is treating us just as they had treated the Christ, He's on the cross and they mistreated Him, we have an opportunity then to go before the Heavenly Father and pray very specifically for that individual or the individuals who have caused us such trouble. You know, I find it interesting in Matthew chapter 5 is we have the Sermon on the Mount from the Master Teacher as Jesus is, is preaching to the people and he gives us a challenge, and I'm telling you, Matthew chapter 5, in this passage in verse 44, is a hard passage. Jesus makes it look very easy as He's on that cross to forgive. And yet, He provides this instruction in Matthew 5 and verse 44. What does He say? He says, you need to love, you need to bless, you need to do good, and you need to pray for those individuals that are your enemies, that curse you, that hate you, that despitefully use you, and persecute you. I'm telling you, that is not easy. That's hard. But if we have the heart of Christ and the mind of Christ, 
and we're following after the example of Christ, then that's what we have to do. And what's even harder is when you look at the word love, it's agape love. He says you've got to agape love your enemies. Now we read about agape love a lot of people in the Bible, but now we're talking about our enemies. We have to show kindness to them. We have to say good words to bless, to do good, even those that hate us, to pray for those that would persecute us, to do harm and use us. That would not be easy. But this is the instruction that has been given. And then what we need to try to do is we try to put ourselves into the shoes of those that are on the other side. Why is this happening? What is going on? For Jesus, He had a purpose for going to that cross. And He looked down upon those others and He saw that they had a need. They, at that point, they didn't realize the need, but they had a need for their sins to be forgiven. And He wanted that. He wished that. That was His prayer. That was His plea that forgiveness would be possible for them. For us, we try to put ourselves in the shoes of others to look at things from their perspective. In Luke chapter 6, again, teaching from the Master Teacher, He says, As ye would have that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. We know that, don't we? That's a golden rule. And here in this passage He says, For if you love those that love you, not really accomplish that much, if you'd lend to those that would lend back, then not, not a whole lot there. But in verse 35, he says, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. Now listen very carefully. If you don't have your Bibles open, open them to Luke 6, verse 35. Luke 6, 35. Because there's additional teaching that's here on the end of this that we didn't read about over in Matthew's account. And the Gospel of Luke records something that's very interesting. He says, now you do this, your reward's going to be great, and you're going to be considered the children of God, the children of the highest. And notice what is said. For that is God. He is kind unto the unthankful and unto the evil. This shows us the nature of God, the character of God of which we are to emulate. And that's why he says, this is what you need to do because here's the character of God. Here is the nature of God. You need to pattern yourself after God. This is who He is, and this is who you should be. If you're His children, this is how you need to act. Because even God does this. In verse 36, He says, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. We look to our enemies. Sometimes for us, that's a hard pill to swallow. But we're looking at the supreme example and the nature and the character of God. God loves. God is merciful. God is compassionate. God is kind even to those that are ungrateful, unthankful, and even to those that are evil. That's why the Bible says that Jesus Christ, He died for all. He shed His blood on the cross for all. His grace hath appeared unto all. Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12. In Ephesians chapter 2, tells us that God who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we are dead in sins, hath made us alive or quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us. How? How God has expressed that to us. His kindness, His grace, His gift. His salvation, His forgiveness, His mercy has been made possible through Jesus Christ. And so we give grace when we have been given less. 
In Luke chapter 23 and verse 35, the people stood beholding the rulers were there. And they were deriding Him. And they said to Him as He was hanging on that cross, what did they say? Oh, He saved others. Let Him save Himself. If He be the Christ, the chosen of God, in verse 37, and saying, if, if thou be the King of the Jews, save thyself. In verse 39, And one of the male factors which hanged and railed on Him said, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Jesus was encouraged by all around Him to save Himself. And you know what? Could have done it. And He didn't. He hung on that cross for you and for me for forgiveness. Now I think it's fascinating because here is Jesus. He's on that cross. And you know what He's accomplishing as He's dying on that cross because that blood that will be shed provides redemption. It is the sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And He's on the cross. And He's praying for forgiveness. And we find individuals receiving that forgiveness. In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when those individuals heard that Gospel sermon, some of those same individuals that were there, we know they were there, as a part of the Passover feast, those same individuals would have come back. And now it's the day of Pentecost. And now you've got all those that are gathered together from all nations there, there fulfilling the prophecies of old. And they hear the Gospel preached. Salvation is provided to them. Forgiveness is preached to them. And He told them what to do. And when they obeyed that, their sins were forgiven. They were added as saved individuals. A saved individual is a person whose sins have been forgiven. And those that were saved were added to the body, to the church, to the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. When they submitted to the, to the request that Peter made, they asked, what do we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, and he told them in verse 38, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he explains what for? For the remission of sins. That is for the forgiveness of sins. Those same individuals had an opportunity to hear about forgiveness. 3,000 of them received the forgiveness of their sins on that day. Some of the same ones that were there that put Jesus on that cross had their sins forgiven. And so we see that Jesus hung on that cross. They tried to get Him to save Himself. Aren't you glad that He didn't call those twelve legions of angels, but His love outweighed the pain and the agony, and He suffered and bled and died on that cross so that we could have forgiveness. You're here and you have not obeyed the gospel. You've not given your life to Jesus. You can do that. Jesus died on the cross for you so that you could be forgiven. Will you respond by giving your life to Jesus Christ? Will you believe that He is the resurrected Messiah, the Savior of the world, and based upon that belief, be willing to turn away from sins? That's what repentance is. That was what was commanded in Acts 17 and verse 30. The times of this ignorance God winked at, He overlooked, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? There's a judgment day that's coming. So He commands them to repent. Today, all men everywhere have to repent. They have to turn away from sin to serve Jesus Christ. Will you do it? Will you confess with your lips, He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. Will you do it? Will you submit the rest of your life to serve Him? Will you submit in baptism so that your sins can be washed away. Acts 22 and verse 16, calling on the name of the Lord. Will you do that? So that you can be saved by our Lord, who is the one that saves you and adds you to His kingdom. Will you do that? Man does not save. It is God that saves. But man has to respond. Man has to access the grace of God by faith. 
according to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Will you access the grace of God by a faith that will submit to the will of God? Will you do it? Or will you reject God's forgiveness? God died for all. I mean, Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for all. But not all will come to Him. Not all will access His grace. Not all will submit to Him. The question is, what will you do? The loving Savior died on the cross for you. His last seven sayings included a plea for forgiveness, for sins to be separated, to be sent away. That was His dying wish. Will you give your life to serve that loving Savior who didn't save Himself? He died to save you. Won't you come? It's together we stand and sing.